Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Secretary Vilsack, you're here in Iowa. You're playing tour guide a little bit. Um, why is it important to have a good relationship with Mexico? Well, it's important to have a good relationship first and foremost with uh, my counterpart in Mexico because you have to have the ability to pick up the phone uh, or visit face to face and have frank and uh, trusted conversation. Uh, so that relationship becomes important to build. Um, I've, I actually have a relationship with Secretary Bilobos for some time, uh, so it's been a little bit easier uh, with him. Uh, it's important for the U.S.-Mexico relationship because so much of what we trade, so much of what we, what we sell overseas, if you will, uh, in our export, uh, one of our number uh, top three markets is Mexico for many of our products. In some cases, it's our number one market. So it's important, obviously, to make sure that we continue to have a good relationship. We continue to identify the problem areas in the relationship and try to work through them. USMCA was... I mean, you were familiar with NAFTA from your previous time. USMCA comes along. That was a big goal of the administ previous administration. How have you sorted through some of those changes and conversations you've had with Mexico? And you can throw in your Canadian counterparts, too. Well, I think the conversation with Mexico has been a little bit easier uh, as it relates to USMCA because the problems we have there, uh, I think we can work through. For example, uh, while it is accurate that uh, Mexico has taken a pretty hard line in terms of genetically engineered crops that are grown in Mexico, it has not prevented that country from continuing to import into the country corn that's grown here in the U.S. using uh, GMO GE technology. Um, our friends in Canada, it's a little different situation. Uh, one of the principal reasons why Congress voted in favor of the USMCA from an agricultural perspective was the belief that Canada would in fact open up its market for U.S. dairy. Uh, we are still having conversations with our Canadian friends about that. Uh, and we have actually triggered the consultation process or begun the consultation process that is provided for in the USMCA when you have a difficulty or a disagreement that's not getting worked, uh, worked through. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of USMCA, that there's actually a mechanism uh, for putting something on the table when you have a disagreement with uh, your trading partner. That's really important. The American worker in the food system right now has gone through many different uh, changes in the last year and a half since COVID. Uh, Meatpacking industry has said they can't get enough workers in. Trucking industry, we don't have enough drivers. Uh, manufacturing plants, we don't have enough workers. Is this anything to do with NAFTA offshoots from years ago? Is this a worker training issue? What are we seeing come to a head other than simple supply and demand? Well, I think there was a major disruption from the pandemic. I mean, look at it. We shut down a substantial portion of the economy of the country. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, we've unfortunately and tragically lost uh, hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens and millions of them have been sick. There has been a major disruption and it causes, uh, I think, a lot of soul searching on the part of a lot of folks. And there may very well be people that were contemplating retirement or contemplating uh, a change in, in opportunity before the pandemic, and maybe this basically accelerated their timeline. Uh, at the end of the day, what you have to do in a disruption is you, you basically have to figure out strategies to cope and to, and to deal with the disruption until you get to a more stable and secure place. Um, I think it, it does emphasize the need in this country to continue to look for ways in which we can honor those who not only work with their head, but also with their hands. Uh, and if there's uh, any long-term issue here, I think it's the fact that for far too long, we didn't understand or appreciate all those folks who, who work with their hands. Last week, you were in Congress talking about the, the meatpacking industry. Is there a stomach politically to try to break up big companies? You talk about competition earlier at the event. There's been programs to help smaller processors. Is this administration looking at more of that help? or more of a breakup of these large players? Well, our, our focus right now is on capacity and competition, and I think they go hand in hand. Uh, if you expand capacity, you're also gonna expand competition. Well, how do you do that? Well, the first thing you do is you take a look at your existing uh, processing capacity, your existing processing plants, and ask the question, are there ways in which you can expand? Are there ways in which you can create new market opportunities? The answer is yes and yes. 
So we're providing resources in the form of grants and loans to be able to expand, uh, to change market opportunities, to expand market opportunities. Is there a way of reducing the cost for existing facilities so they stay in business? Answer, yes. We're providing resources to reduce the cost of inspection. But is there also a way in which we can use resources to expand new capacity or to build on significantly to existing capacity? And the answer to those questions is yes. And we're doing all of that. Um, and I think we want to see how that works. Um, and I believe that o over the course of the next year or so, you're going to begin to see investments uh, being made, uh, processing being expanded. And what this is going to do is it creates competition, but it also creates resiliency. And part of the challenge here that we found with having too few processing facilities, when one shuts down, it creates chaos in the market, it disrupts the market. We've got to have more, uh, more, more capacity. We have to have the ability to shift uh, because this is the last disruption that we're going to be faced with. It may be drought, it may be fire, it may be COVID, it may be something else, but, but we know that these disruptions are going to occur. So the focus now is on not just great efficiency uh, and productivity, but also on, uh, uh, on uh, re resiliency. And with resiliency, it means expanded capacity, and, and we're investing in expanded capacity. We're also uh, making sure that we strengthen uh, the rules and laws governing the relationship between the producers and the packers, right? Um, there may be circumstances and situations in some industries where, uh, where the playing field's not quite level, uh, and that's why we get into the Packers and Stockyards Act. It may also be that we need to have better discovery. We be better have understanding of what, what the price actually is. There's so, so few cash uh, transactions uh, that it sometimes you, you begin to wonder whether or not uh, the price that you're being quoted is really the price it should be quoted. So more price discovery. So a variety of things that need to be done and are being done. If only another two days, we'd get into price discovery for the rest of the conversation. Secretary <laughs> Vilsack, thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Tuesday's MTOM podcast will include the Secretary's comments on China, infrastructure, and the UAW strike against John Deere.